Good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing? I hope everyone is well. I'm bringing you greetings from sunny and humid Pensacola, Florida, uh, where I would really much like to be somewhere it's actually fall, but hey, we'll just deal with the uh, late summer, or I think it's called Indian summer. So um, I want to thank everyone for having me here today. Uh, is it is, an, is, an, is an honor for me to do this today, and it's actually an extra honor because today is it's my birthday, and I thought I'd celebrate it with you all. So, so uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Tanya's giving me the snaps. I appreciate it. I was joking with Tanya earlier about the, the lead-in music. Reminded me of um, Kevin Belton on PBS, uh, New Orleans Chef. So I thought we were going to make some shrimp and grits today. So loosen up, folks. We're, it's a Saturday, so come on. Let's, we're going to have... Some openness, and we're going to have some fun. We're going to hopefully see some smiles, even though we're talking about some serious information here. Um, I guess a little about myself. My name is Chelsea Rice. I'm a type 1 diabetic. Uh, I've been in type 1 for over 30 years. I am also <clears throat> been a stand-up comic, as well as, obviously, a type 1 diabetes advocate. Um, it has been my honor to be an advocate since around 2012. Um, and I actually take advantage of any opportunity that I can come across to, to support the efforts of helping others navigate their way through this life with diabetes. And along with, um, I'm going to be talking about today, which is going to be uh, caregiving. And I don't, I'm not a caregiver myself, but I respect and honor those help those who are living with this disease, especially the ones that actually live with themselves. So I want to give honor to those and the time out to join us today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, now, when we talk about caregiving, it spans a wide variety of relationships. Now, on this panel, we have mothers. Uh, we have people who care for the elderly. Uh, we have people who our patients themselves, and people who are caregiving for those with diabetes and people who are both. And we aim to explore the nuances, joys, and challenges of these unique <clears throat> relationships. Now, before I introduce our panelists, I want to acknowledge that we were meant to have another panelist sharing their experiences with us today. Kadira. Bagban, our global chapter representative for India, Insulin for All, unexpectedly and sadly passed away late last month, leaving behind her husband and an 11-month-old baby boy. Now, Kadiri was a tireless and lifelong advocate, pediatrician, artist. She gave so much to the Type 1 International Global Advocacy Network and to her community in India and was instrumental in shaping this panel with her perspectives and experiences as caregiver and advocate. Kadira had lived with type 1 diabetes since childhood and served as an inspiration to others, especially teens and young women. Uh, so right now I'd like to just take 30 seconds or so for just a quick moment of silence to remember her and we'll also be showing a memorial for her. And thank you all for the, for the brief moment of silence and moments of remembrance for Kadira. <clears throat> now, we're not strangers to loss in our community, sadly, but true. But that doesn't make it easier. We work hard to celebrate our love and relationships. As we acknowledge that having a chronic illness impacts us every day. And so to carry us into the vital and needed conversations about caregiving for others and self 
We have with us today, Tanya Hegeman, who lives with type one diabetes and provides support for her mother with diabetes. Tracy Ramey, who cares for her daughter with type one. Yamurai McElroy, who lives with diabetes and provides support for her mother with diabetes. And Medulla Bargava, who lives with diabetes and leads a support group for kids with diabetes four days a week. So as I said before, we have a wide variety of experiences with care represented on our panel. There's a phrase, it takes a village to raise a child, but that really can apply to any type of caregiver. Coming out of a pandemic, I think a lot of people are feeling a toll of isolation and just having a really different understanding of what it looks like to feel and feel like what it, to cut off from support ways. Now, to start the conversation off, what role does your support network play in caregiving for you? Who makes up your support network? Tracy, can you repeat that, please? We, we couldn't hear all of it. Oh, I see it's in the chat. What role does your support network play in caregiving? Should I start? <laughs> I'll start. Hi, everybody. Happy birthday, Chelsea. Um, Thank you. Um, and, you know, Chelsea is very special to me because he was the first person I ever saw talking about diabetes in a different way. Um, it wasn't all about the pain and gloom. It was about the pain and gloom, but it was also funny. And, you know, that has always been a source of inspiration for me. And having, you know, seeing him out there, and recognizing that there was a community of people who were going beyond the, you know, the, the stereotypes of what diabetes is, um, you know, what, uh, how we're supposed to be with it, how we should act with it, how we should talk. Um, and, you know, recently I was, you know, a stranger was asking me about, you know, my pump or my insulin, whatever. And they, and I said, oh, I'm type one diabetic. And they said, oh, I'm so sorry for you. I'm so sorry. And I said, well, actually I'm not sorry because it gave me a community that I never would have expected. And it has given me connections and a voice in a way that I never would have expected, even with having a mother with type one diabetes. Um, I never understood how important it how much of a blessing it was for me to get it so that I could help her take care of herself um, as well as, you know, give back to a community. So, you know, my advocacy really began, you know, with the, with, with the, especially the diabetes online community. Um, and it, it has really changed my life. Thanks for that, Tanya. And uh, I just got a note that uh, my sound may be going in and out, and I apologize. I may be having some internet uh, wonkiness going on over here. Um, <clears throat> who else would like to, uh, to comment on that, that initial question of um, what role does your support network play in your caregiving? I can speak to that. Again, happy birthday, Chelsea. So... Um, my, it's been pivotal to have a support network um, just in place. And it's definitely something that I had to seek out because that feeling of isolation when you're trying to care for your child and you don't know who to turn to or you're talking to people who don't have the same experience and they're just like, they can sympathize but they can't really empathize with you. So I really had to um, look for people online or kind of look for people 
in the community. And TUNI has been kind of pivotal in that in finding uh, within even my chapter of Insulin for All, um, people that are local to me that have, that are, uh, that have either children with uh, type one or that are type one themselves and I can kind of bounce ideas um, against them, but it's so important, even if you don't have someone that has type one or any other type of diabetes in your corner to have someone that um, you can uh, expressly talk to about your, your time, because it's a lot. Thanks for that. Yeah, I can, um, I can definitely relate. Uh, as I said, I've been living with diabetes for over 30 years. And when I first started, I had pretty much no one because uh, this was the 80s. So there was no online access or no um, any groups I could reach out to other than you know, picking up a phone and trying to find somebody I knew that had diabetes. So yeah, that I can, uh, I can clearly attest to. Maybe I think uh, I'll go then. Uh, am I audible? All right. And <clears throat> now thinking about the intersections of identity that are represented here today, do you feel you experience different barriers because of any of the identities you hold, either being a person of color or being people who identify as female, being a person of, with diabetes or others? Yeah, so I I wanted to uh, to answer the first question. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Know, yeah, I'll I'll just uh, yeah both maybe both the questions. Okay. So I am living with type one diabetes. Uh, this October I'll complete thirty years with it, and uh, I I also realized that I am a caregiver for the caregivers of uh, children living with type 1 diabetes. I have seen parents calling me every other day, uh, discussing about their challenges, even crying out. They, they just want someone who cannot, you know, who, who just doesn't judge them and can be a good listener. And I think uh, being kind of a person who can absorb all that, uh, you know, pain that they are going through and not judge them and not, not you know, uh, just suggest anything, but just keep listening to their, uh, their, their, you know, problems. I think that that has uh, been a very crucial role in my life. And uh, re also as a referee between, you know, the parents as well as the uh, children, uh, because uh, sometimes if there is any conflict between the two, uh, both of them would would like uh, me to actually, you know, discuss about that challenge and come up to a solution which can, uh, you know, benefit both of them. So I think uh, caregiving is not like just in the family, but, you know, to the whole community also sometimes the patient advocate has to take up that role and to be, uh, you know, maybe at, at any any time uh, in, in, a, in the day or at night. And uh, talking about, uh, you know, the second question, uh, I would like to actually reflect from uh, my community of people living with type 1 diabetes. And uh, uh, I recently, I... I came to know that uh, a father of a uh, children who has been newly diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, he left uh, his child and his wife just because he didn't want a ch child with uh, any kind of a disability or any kind of, you know, disease. And they, like, he simply left them alone. And it's just like that, that woman is all alone. She is the single uh, parent now taking care of the child and doesn't know anything about type 1 diabetes. Unfortunately, that child not just have 
uh, type 1 diabetes, but other uh, medical conditions as well. And uh, it's, it's very challenging when something like this turns up. Or, I mean, another case, if I talk about uh, the father, the mother, and the child, all three of them uh, have type 1 diabetes. And the parents, uh, they wouldn't use any kind of a sensor or any kind of a medical device so that they can just afford it for their child. And it becomes really tough uh, on the family that, uh, you know, taking care of, of a medical condition like type 1 diabetes and uh, affording it uh, in just one uh, single house, it's, it's really challenging. I think... Uh, I have seen so many stories recently that that just you know uh, is overwhelming and really it touches my heart. Yeah. Right. I think it's all also about the women that uh, yes. it, it 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 comes uh, you know. Uh, finally to the women that, you know, uh, she is the one who has to take care of all the things. Even if a child has been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, women is blamed that, you know, something, something uh, mm -hmm. in her has been wrong that the child has, uh, has this kind of a disease. It's, it's such a big stigma around uh, if we talk about, you know, gender and type 1 diabetes. I really appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I'm sorry, I'm cutting in, Chelsea, but um, I oh, really yeah. also wanted to highlight that, and um, and I think it's a it's an important part of this conversation of caregiving um, because you know um, I am a single woman without children by choice by a, a you know very happy choice, but that means that I also have to make sure that I am on top of myself, right? Um, and that, you know, it's also not easy dating. Like you said, you know, there's uh, there are some people who are just like, no, I, wanna, I don't want to deal with that. You know, I don't want to have to know about that. Um, when I was first diagnosed, I was um, in a relationship with a person who was like, well, I don't want to see you inject yourself. And I was like, and they would say, don't do that. And I'd be like, what are you? you want me to die? <laughs> you know, they really had zero concept, you know, of that this was a moment by moment um, disease. This is not a, you know, oh, you know, oh, your blood sugar is okay. Okay. Then you should be fine. You know, like it's moment by moment. And so often, you know, women are the caregivers of children and parents and themselves, which often gets pushed to the, to the background. Um, you know, that our care for ourselves becomes, you know, not the primary goal, but it's, we put everyone else first. And, you know, it is, it is so important that, you know, to acknowledge that, you know, that, you know, I know Chasey, uh, Chelsea has um, a wife who I'm sure helps him and supports him. Um, you know, like there, there are many women in, in everyone's life who will be the ones to check on you. And, and I think that it's important that men um, also recognize that inequality. Yeah, I mean, for me, my wife is actually, I guess you could say, borderline diabetic. She's on uh, what like metformin, but before that even happened to her, I had to really kind of just have, like, you know, back then it was so long ago that I had to really had to sit down and have like a on paper Zoom meeting with her. It's like, look, this is what I need you to understand about what is happening with me because <clears throat> this is the same kind of stuff you deal with even at work. You have to sit down and stop someone and say, look. At some point, this is gonna this might happen to me, and I'm gonna react a certain way. And it takes a great deal of trust, in my opinion, 
uh, especially at work, but also with family members or, or, your, or your spouse. Now, I mean, I know this. I've got family members I wouldn't dare trust if I had a hypo, if I had a low around them, because they'd either freak out or they just wouldn't be responsible enough to help me. But, and I've never been in a situation where I, I needed a said caregiver. But of course, my wife is going to be my caregiver should something happen to me. She was there for me when I had my eye surgery, well, well both surgeries. So she understood that aspect of it. She had to, you know, go in learning the hard way. Um, so I don't know that much about relying on a caregiver, but I think that there's a little bit of responsibility on the person that actually has the condition. You have to really kind of make it plain to them. This is what I'm going to need you to do at some point in time. And and oftentimes when I meet other people who have diabetes, I can't stress that enough. You can't, this is, this is, this is a heavy load to put on somebody. And it's a heavy load to put on somebody that you love because somebody that loves you is going to have a hard time watching you deal with the thing. Like, I mean, I can't imagine what my parents felt when I had both eyes, you know, had surgery on both of my eyes. Uh, to see me after the surgery not be able to wake up because I had some sort of reaction to the anesthesia. So I had to take the, the mantle in a sense to help them understand what, what I need them to do. And um, it's, like I said, it's a heavy load to place on someone. So you really have to pick and choose who is the best person that you can trust with that, you know. That's a really good point. I didn't, uh, did you have anything to, didn't to jump in there and bogart the conversation? For myself, I, um, so I also, my daughter has had, type. it'll be five years in January, type one. I also have type two, I'm considered pre-diabetic now, but I had an episode at work the other day where low for me is like 84 and I was like yep I'm feeling it so I'm I work in a I work at a, um, a school I'm a preschool assistant so I'm like feeling weak having to like block a child from running out of the cafeteria and I'm like okay someone come over here I gotta go check my blood sugar and go get something to eat really quick so it's like I know the feeling of being low and the feeling of being high and I can like empathize with people but like just um so I think that kind of puts me in a different place to where um, when I care for my daughter on um, on that level of just knowing like, OK, this is painful. I think that that is not talked about enough that like, yeah, you have these like ups and downs and stuff like that. But no, being low hurts like it physically, like at least to me, it doesn't hurt um, and you feel weak. And it just it's I think that because um, diabetes is manageable, people don't um, in the outside of the community don't really understand like these minute to minute decisions, you're making these decisions and your body is like not up to par. It's, your body is not feeling well when you're doing these minute by minute decisions, but you're still doing it. Right, right. Can I, I, I really think this is such an important, you know, part of the conversation about caregiving is, you know, how we care for ourselves and exactly what Chelsea was saying is articulating needs, which is never an easy thing. And, but on top of that, getting others to respect our needs, which is also not an easy thing. Um, and, you know, I, talk a lot about uh, asking for accommodations at work. I'm an English professor at a college. And, you know, when I first got that job, right around when I was first diagnosed, so I had no idea what my needs were. You know, I really didn't have clarity around what I would need on a day-to-day -day basis in a working situation. And it took 
you know, several instances of, like you said, you know, having lows at the time I wasn't wearing any devices, you know, not knowing, having to take time out to manually check. What does that feel like? I'm giving a lecture to a you know crowd of people. I'm starting, you know, like, and, and having to really articulate with my doctor. And I had had doctors who had said to me, you don't need any accommodations. You'll be fine. But I finally found a doctor who respected my needs and said, okay, well, let's sit down and really map out how this needs to happen. Because it can't even be a conversation with you and, and your manager. It has to be a conversation with you and your doctor filling out paperwork to give to HR and to say, this is how I need to operate in order to be the best employee, whatever that you can get out of me. And I'm, I'm ready to be dedicated, but I will need, you know, um, you know, time in, you know, breaks for eating. I will need, you know, this person to understand that if I have an emergency, these are the things that need to happen. And it's so important to, you know, for all of us. And I think sometimes with this disease, like you said, moment to moment decisions, you know, not having community or feeling like, you know, there's so many cerebral things that have to go on in your physical body, which is suffering. Um, we often downplay our own needs. We forget, we want to get over it. You know, we want to say, oh, I have a low and I'll be, you know, I'll just eat something and it'll be fine. But, you know, my doctor was like, no, you need recovery time after that. And I knew it, but it, for me to articulate it on paper for my job to say, listen, you know, when this thing happens, I'm done for the day, you know, and that, you know, if this thing happens, then I need to, you know, whatever, change my schedule. So it is, you know, so incredibly important, you know, to first of all, most important of anything as a care, as a caregiver, and also as a caregiver of self, um, to really articulate your needs and make sure that they're respected. Right, right. Yeah, and, and kind of what we've been talking about, um, kind of almost kind of covers the next question, because the next question was really about self care and how do you care for yourself? Um, and honestly, what Tanya spoke about dealing with work and accommodations, that's, <laughs> that's another, that's another event altogether, because I can go on and on about, you know, my experience recently, uh, which was actually a new experience in dealing with that. But, um, just in short, how would, how do you care for yourself? I think uh, I'll go with this. And uh, I think this is something really, really challenging. I'll share uh, an experience I had with a pharma company, a renowned pharma company. And uh, uh, because there are people in my community who really need support with the diabetes supplies. And uh, we, we, you know, sometimes do not get any, any, uh, option. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, I think there's some power cut. I'll just, yeah. So it's, it's very challenging in the, uh, community sometimes to get the supplies and we have to go to the farmer. And, uh, this is what happened. We signed the MOU. We, we shared all our paperwork and everything, but it's been almost like four or five months and we haven't uh, heard from their side what what uh, supply we can get or whatever support we can get, what they promised us, I think that has never uh, been turned up. And uh, also, uh, uh, you know, personal experience that uh, I had uh, during the second wave of COVID and uh, you know, in Delhi, like the whole public public health system had crashed, and uh, we we didn't even have you know supplies for oxygen cylinders, and there were no bed uh, in the hospitals. Somehow, uh, I I did manage to have one. Uh, I landed up into DKA. My SpO two levels and all were fine. But uh, having DK at that sixth day of uh, COVID, 
I, I clearly remember, I mean, the doctors were all taking care of my COVID and its related medicines, but nobody was there to take care of my insulin, of my uh, diabetes related problems. And I was all alone over there. Uh, thankfully, I had a sensor with me and a reader. And it was all me who was taking care of myself and nobody, uh, I mean, I could even talk to, uh, you know, okay, this is my sugar levels. This is uh, the, you know, dose that I need to take. Uh, I think uh, this, this really has taught me that, you know, caregiving for ourselves is very important. Understanding that, you know, uh, whether we have someone or not, we do have to take care of ourselves. We have to be really strong in such situations and never, ever give up. Yeah, I'll stop here. No, thank you for that. Did anyone else have anything to add before we go into our Q&A? There was a really... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say there was a quote in the um, chat that was really good. I just wanted to say it, of course. Oh, um, I don't know who said it, but uh, Katie responded to it. It's important to protect your spirit as you advocate for your needs. I think that's incredibly beautiful and so true. So thank you. Spot whoever on. Put that on Definitely there. Spot on. Yeah, it really is true. Sorry. Go ahead, Tracy. Yeah, I would just say that um, it has been, as my daughter's gotten older, um, she has, she's had it since she was six and she's 11 now. So as she's gotten older, we've kind of have progressed in our use of um, technology. So she does have a CGM and insulin pump now, and um, I'm able to kind of offshoot some of that care. So her dad can look at the, her numbers and kind of help her decide things and um we're we have a close relationship with the nurse at school and she can kind of help navigate those things too so it's really important for me again going back to that community to kind of lean on community and who is there for you to be able to um not have so much of my headspace into okay what are her numbers what's this what I do because it's that helps with my being able to take care of myself so I can kind of, I don't have to know everything all at once. Like I don't even have the Dexcom follow app on my phone because it was glitching or whatever. I'm like, okay, she's good because somebody else has got her and she's at the age now where she can kind of manage some of those things herself too. So it's, I can free up some head space and be able to take time to do some things that I need for myself. So self-care for me looks like watching a movie or um, just processing. Sometimes self-care is just staring off in the space for 10 minutes, but it's that time that I need for myself to just decompress from working and making decisions for children and then coming home and making decisions for myself and for my daughter. So it's kind of Self-care is super important. Um, and if you are a caregiver and if you are just, again, a patient. I'd like to add something that um, both of you, you said, and, and this is something that it goes into caregiving, especially for a senior, um, technology. Um, my mom has had type one, you know, longer than I have, but, um, you know, she's never, and in fact, it, it affected my decision to get a pump because she, her pump was always failing or confusing or, you know, inadequate or something. Um, and now that I do have, um, a pump and a CGM, um, I love my pump. I'm on a pod and it's very simple and straightforward to me, but she's, you know, stuck with Medtronic, not maybe not stuck, but she's on Medtronic for, you know, because of insurance um, and doesn't really have the techno technological savvy to know how to operate it at all times. 
um, and to, you know, and she actually just uh, is about to get a tandem and I have to sit in on the, you know, the hours of training with her so that I can advise her um, on the technology uh, because I don't necessarily, I don't know what's going on with hers and she doesn't know what's going on with mine. Um, and the other thing is that, um, I'm so blessed to have a sister who she takes, uh, the responsibility for being, um, you know, on my mom's constant glucose monitor with her so that I don't have to, you know, be monitoring her and myself at the same time. So that was something that we really had, you know, I had to articulate because it was, it's tempting for me to know where her sugars are because then I can kind of like overmanage her. I can micromanage her, you know, and in a way deflect from my own self. But, um, but it was also so that my sister could have a clarity because she lives in the same city as my mom and I live um, not too far away, but my sister's closer. Um, but she could understand those moments to moments and she could call me and you know because there are certain things like you said that you just cannot be in charge of at all times and the technology is as wonderful as it is and i saw someone else saying this in the chat and miradula was saying this too often the care the you know the medical professionals don't know how to use it they know nothing about you know this one or that one and there have been many times and in fact just recently you know, my mom was talking to her doctor about, you know, wanting to do um, temporary basal programs. And her doctor said, well, why would you want to do that? And I was like, uh, what? Well, <laughs> I said, oh, she clearly doesn't understand the technology. She allows for the diabetes educator or for the tech person to be the one to know that. And she doesn't make, you know, those decisions. And, you know, so it's really important for us to, to recognize that sometimes the technology can be, you know, although it's usually really great for caregiving, it can also be an impediment. And that, you know, we have to recognize with our seniors that, you know, as great as the technology is for them, it's also important that they have a partner in understanding how to use that technology effectively. Mm -hmm. All right, so we got time for one question. Um, this question is from Mindy. How do you deal with diabetes in the work environment? Who else are you are on your care team at work? Mudua, do you want to answer that? Yeah, so uh, so thankfully, uh, I have all the, because I am a public health professional and I am surrounded by all professionals and they understand what is diabetes. Some of them also have diabetes. So it's, it's never been a struggle. They have been very supportive, but I do want to highlight, uh, you know, uh, especially the cause that I am now advocating for very, very strongly. Uh, a child living with type 1 diabetes had been denied entering into the school because that uh, child had diabetes, type 1 diabetes, and uh, the school authorities didn't want to take any kind of a risk or anything uh, to, to handle this kind of a medical condition. I personally went and met uh, those uh, authorities, those uh, you know people who are at a uh, you know uh, at a stage where they can be decision uh, makers, and uh, it it was very shocking for me because even they, being uh, you know the principal of the school, didn't know the basic difference between type one and type two diabetes. They started talking about their medical condition, and then. Uh, talking about the traditional medicine, how that has helped them. So it's so difficult. I think uh, this is this is something that we really need to address the, the workplace ac uh, accommodation. And uh, what we had just asked, even, you know, the child, we had taught that child everything, how to inject herself, how to uh, take, uh, you know, uh, uh, glucose uh, tablet or something when when it's a hypo we just needed a support 
uh, for the child in in case of emergency, especially during the examination time. And uh, I don't think uh, they they have agreed. Uh, they still agree because they do not want to take any any kind of uh, you know that that uh, uh, what should I say <laughs> I mean responsibility to handle a, a child and I, I I don't understand because children they that that school is the place where they have to spend lots of their time and uh, if they don't feel supportive if they don't feel safe in that environment we cannot uh, think of a holistic development of that child a child can also have you know thyroid a child can also have celiac disease but if a child has type 1 diabetes and it's related to blood some somehow it just becomes so scary for everyone mm -hmm. so i think uh, this this has really touched me and i'm uh, as a as a fellow uh, of women lift health uh, gates foundation i've been working around this and uh, hope with my t1 international team i'll be able to take this uh, forward this is such a problem uh, even in the united states you know we we have um you know in new york so in new york city we have five different boroughs and um up until maybe a year or two ago, there was only one diabetes nurse that had to serve all five boroughs. Now, you know, in a two mile radius in New York City, there might be five elementary schools, you know, like there's that many people. And what I was hearing from a lot of moms um, that they were meant to be responsible for go leaving their jobs going to the child's school to give the child insulin. Um, there would be no one there. No one had any clarity. Um, I once visited a child at their school, their after school program. Um, and the mom was still trying to understand a lot of what was going on. And they were having a pizza party. And the kid is like sweating. He's just sweating, sweating, sweating. And he was so excited to see me. He started running around. And I thought maybe he's just sweating from that. But then I said, what's your, what's your sugar? It was 500 because they had a pizza party and no one thought, oh, we should give him insulin. And on top of that, he was wearing a pod, his PDM, right? That connects the pod with the, you know, how much insulin you're supposed to be getting in your, in your, um, for your basil was like in two rooms away, buried under all these, you know, backpacks and, and coats. So there was no communication. There was no clarity, you know, that was made to the, you know, people there that they could have, he could have really been sick in that moment. And, you know, there are so many stories that are like this, where, again, you know, the parents are considered to be responsible for this. Thank God there was a class action suit. And now there's, you know, one nurse for each borough, but that nurse has to travel to all the different schools and make sure that the resident nurse there is educated and that, you know, that person understands what the kid needs. But it's always going to be, you know, especially for children on on the parents. And that becomes unfair when you're paying taxes, when you are supporting the school district to care for your child or be responsible for your child and they cannot be. Um, and to get back to the, the question around work, you know, they're really it's really important that parents and, you know, adults understand their rights. You know, like I said, when I first started, you know, at my job now 15 years ago, uh, I had no idea that I had rights. Like they were, they were like, so what you have diabetes? Like what? <laughs> like they really had, you know, they wanted, you know, they wanted me to just forget about it. And it took, you know, situations where I had to really advocate for myself and recognize that, you know, it is, it's not just, you know, uh, my right, but it's my responsibility for others, right? That I don't want to put anyone else in a situation where they're panicked, right? Or they don't know what to do. Um, and I wish I had more people that I could trust at my institution, but there might be one or two people, you know, who have an understanding. They're not, they don't understand, right? 
And those are not people who are with me at all times. So, you know, it becomes on me. And this is why I, you know, I change my accommodations often because as I grow older, my, my needs change, you know, as our schedule changes, my needs change. And so what's important, I think for me is that I know what I need to do. I know who, you know, who, where, what, when needs to happen. I alert people, you know, ahead of time, but that still does not do anything. So it go, it really does go back to articulating your own needs. Well, folks, we have come to the end of this panel. I want to thank all the panelists for their time and uh, commitment for being here and giving us their insight. What we're going to do now is pass it back over to, was it Ian? And we're going to carry on. So thank you all for joining us. Appreciate you having me and take care. <laughs>